You're listening to the Good Food CFO Podcast, where we focus on financial strategies for building a profitable food business. I'm your host, Sarah Delavan. Today's episode is an extra special episode on the three pillars of a successful food business. In this roundtable style show, I am joined by two of my favorite women in the industry, Katie Melezova of Real Food Brands and Ali Ball of Food Biz Wiz. Together, we're discussing how brand strategy, sales strategy, and financials must come together to build a successful, stable, and profitable food or beverage company. I am so excited for you to be a fly on the wall for this conversation because we have so much great insight for you. We also have an awesome giveaway where you can win an hour of consulting time with all three of us. Let's get to it. Hi, Sarah and Katie. I'm so excited to be on Zoom with you guys. Same. Nice. Hello. Please. I, I'm really glad you agreed to get together and do a podcast episode for all three of our, our pods, because I think that we've got so much to talk about in the world of building successful food businesses. So before we dive in, I want to make sure that we, all of our listeners know who we are. So let's do a quick intro and then we'll, we'll get into our episode. Sarah, do you want to go first? I'd love to. Uh, my name is Sarah Delavan. I'm a food business financial consultant and freelance CFO. I help good food businesses build financially sustainable and profitable businesses. I'm super excited to be here today. Katie, how about you? Good. I am a food and beverage brand strategist. So I work with food and beverage companies to help set their brands apart and position themselves to stand out in crowded markets. So we do that um, through brand strategy, which we'll get into much more in the podcast, but we really think about both defining that and then aligning it across everything that you do as your North Star. So I'm glad to see you guys. Me too. And so I'm Allie Ball. For those of you guys who don't know me, I am a former grocery buyer turned wholesale consultant, and I help brands understand how to get on the retail shelf and how to have high sales once you are there through my online course, Retail Ready. All right, you guys, we got a lot to talk about, but how are you guys doing? Happy New Year. Happy New Year. Happy New Year. I'm so excited to dive into this conversation because I think it's so interesting. And I don't know if any of the listeners know this, but we share or, or have, you know, a few clients in common. And I think that was part of the idea that, that sparked this conversation after seeing, you know, the value that someone gets from, from talking about sort of the three pillars of building a successful food brand. So I'm, the new year is great and it's getting even better because I'm excited to talk about this with you guys today. Me too. I, I love that we share clients. I think it's so valuable for people to realize that you can't, build, or it's very hard to build your food business in a silo. And there are so many aspects to, to creating a successful business. And, you know, one person can't do it all alone. Yeah, that's so true. Because, you know, as I mentioned in the intro with your brand strategy, when you, it really encompasses everything that you do. So even if you're not thinking about it as brand strategy, having you wear the hat of the general manager where you're thinking about all of the pieces working together. It's just so important. So I'm really excited to dig into these three pillars. So let's recap what the three pillars are. I don't think we've yep. revealed That's this. A good point. <laughs> <laughs> Sarah, you want to go first? Or I guess maybe Katie, you're, you're, we start with you, right? Sure. Well, we talk about the three pillars today representing, you know, those of you who know us know that we're representing brand strategy, financials and sales strategy. So you know, you could, you could figure out which one you think should go first, but we're going to talk about all three of them and they really do need to work together. That's the main point that when one of these pillars falls down, that the other ones will suffer also. So we want to help you organize and strategize and get all the pieces in order so that, um, so that you have a successful food business. So when we think about brand strategy, we think about all the different cross-functional areas of your business, literally everything that goes into your business. We want to set that North star with your brand strategy so that you are positioned in the market. You know how to set yourself apart. Um, you, I like to say that you meet your consumer's needs in a way that your competitors either can't or won't. So when we think about it that way, really it encompasses everything that you do. You set that strategy and then that, uh, that North star guides you in 
you know, in all the cross function areas from operations to sales to finances, and you know what you're working towards. And it gives people such a sense of relief because they, they know what they're laddering up to versus, you know, kind of feeling sometimes if you don't have that in place, like you're sort of chasing your tail or stuck in the mud, you just don't know what you're working towards. So that's, that's sort of brand strategy in a nutshell. Um, we start with the three C's in terms of, if you picture a Venn diagram, there's the competitors, the consumers, and your company. And then we really want to focus in the place where you'll meet your consumer's needs in a way that your competitors can't or won't, like I mentioned earlier. So that's what we really dive into in terms of brand strategy. So once we define that and your brand pillars and your positioning and your personality, all those good things, you just have a real sense of clarity and confidence about how you will show up in the marketplace and set your brand apart and really connect with your consumers and buyers. Um, now that story doesn't, I know that we'll get into this and I'm excited to hear your point of view on this, Allie, but the story doesn't change in terms of who you are as a brand, but the way that you tell it and the things that you focus on really do change depending on who you're talking to. So I know we'll get into that a little bit too, because that's you know, obviously your area of expertise, but that's just a little bit about the brand strategy pillar and some of the things that we think about and some of the things that we'll talk about today. Katie, I think that's so important. And I love what you're, what you're sharing with us about brand strategy. And I wonder if you can talk a little bit about like, when does the brand strategy development really start? And I ask that question because so many business owners, you know, that I meet, and I'm sure is the same for both of you, they've got a product idea um, and something they're really passionate about, but I don't know that the brand necessarily exists at that, at that point. Can you talk a bit about how you go from product to brand strategy? Yes. Yes. I love that you asked that Sarah, because it really is like the magic happens when you go from having a good product that people love to creating a really strong, great brand. And so that's such an important question because it really starts day one. You know, I like to say that we shouldn't leave all the fun to big brands and big agencies when it comes to brand strategy. I want to make this really approachable and it's not easy work, but it's fun. I mean, it really, when everything comes together, it makes everything that you do so much easier. Like one of you mentioned earlier. So the things that we can think about, you know, as your business grows, you might get more sophisticated in terms of the way that you think about your brand strategy and maybe even the exercises that you dig into. But I know, Allie, you cover a lot of, you know, the foundational pieces in Retail Ready also, but um, thinking about the things, like it's never too early. You should, from day one, be thinking about your consumers and their needs and your competitors and, you know, who's in the marketplace. And some people say, I don't want to think about my competitors. I just have blinders on and, you know, I know what my product's good at. But if you don't know what else is out there, you know, I always say that if you don't know that you can't be, that you're different and that how to set it apart, if you don't just have a landscape of what's going on. And again, Ali, you can speak better to this than me even, but buyers also want to understand that, you know, that you're, you know, your category. Yeah. And so knowing your competitors is this really important piece of it. So again, that starts day one. And I have exercises that I share to, you know, they're pretty simple, but it makes such an impact with the people that I work with because laying out the competitors and what their key messages are, something always comes up that they didn't notice either that everybody's saying the same thing or that nobody's saying something. And then they have to figure out if nobody's saying it because it's a terrible idea or, or if nobody's <laughs> saying it because they're uniquely positioned to provide that value in the market. So long story short, never too early to be thinking about brand strategy. It can evolve with your business as it goes. Um, and those three C's, that's why I really like to start at those basics, the competitors, consumers, and then what your company advantages are. We've got exercises that we go through for each of those and then synthesize it to really help create that strategy so that you're consistently working towards the same vision. So uh, does that answer? You it, know, it's interesting what either one of you think or you'd add to that. Yeah, it totally answers the question. And it, it really makes me then think about the financial pillar um, because there are parallels when you said, you know, it's never too early to start and it's mm -hmm. <laughs> as you grow, right? I feel the exact same way about the finances. Um, it's never too early to start thinking about, you know, what does it cost to make one unit of my product just right now, even before I have launched, you know, um, to start investigating what's a kitchen rental space going to cost me? Mm -hmm. What, what are my, what competitors, you know, do I have direct competitors in the market and mm -hmm. 
price points and really just pulling together both the sort of the brand strategy information, almost like a, like a giant brainstorm, right? In the beginning. And, and you do the same with financials. And after you simply gather that information, you can start building financial models and, you know, sort of build that core financial piece for your business. And, and like I think I said a moment ago, it then informs a bit more of your brand strategy, right? And then it informs your, right. your sales strategy a bit and, and it all works together so synergistically. So yeah, really great. It's funny that you mentioned that because I feel like when, so often when people come into Retail Ready, they've skipped those two pieces. They've mm-hmm. skipped the financial strategy and they've, you know, they think they've done the brand strategy, but not as in depth as you go with Katie and mm-hmm. as you go with them, Katie. And I, I feel like it's every so often people just want to skip to sales, right? They're like, I need revenue. Like, give me, give me the money. Like, I, I don't have time for, for those other things. So I'm, I'm and so And there's something happy. to be said for revenue. <laughs> right. Oh, for sure, right? Like, you know, revenue, sales makes a business. Uh, we, need, we need revenue, but you're, there's nothing more heartbreaking. And I'm sure you guys see this too, of, of, a, of a business who has high revenue, they have high sales, you know, they're in lots of stores and yet they're not profitable. Yeah. I see that a lot. Oh, it hurts. It hurts so bad. <laughs> and it's interesting that you bring that up right now, because as, as you were just talking, Ali, I was thinking about, um, you know, the, those, those business owners who don't do that work to really think about brand strategy, but then also the numbers of their business, they can have a great product. They can be selling really, really well, but if they haven't gone through that full financial modeling process, what I see quite often, unfortunately, is that they're selling their product at a price that produces a profitable product. Mm. Right? They've got a gross profit margin in their business, but it's not it's not going to help them build a profitable business, which is the ultimate goal. And you really have to look at it from, from that level. Um, and, and, you know, it doesn't have to be an overwhelming process, but, but there, there is, you know, a series of steps that you can take to say, okay, if I charge X number of dollars for my product, the product has a profit margin, but after I pay for rent and labor and all the other costs of my business, how much do I have to sell mm. and is it possible to break even or be profitable at some point. Can we dive a little bit deeper into that, Sarah? Because I think that, that that's something that it's so easy to be like, okay, well, I know my ingredient costs. Like I, you know, maybe hopefully they're even like factoring their labor in like right from the beginning. And so they're like, I can make my yeah fruitcake at this price. Like I, I'm, I did my financials. Here's but you're, the- you're saying that's not it. Yeah. And here's a really interesting thing. So you bring up labor and uh, people are taught to look at your ingredient costs, look at your packaging costs, and then figure out what is it going to cost me to produce one unit of my product. And I was literally just doing this with a client the other day. Um, They shall remain nameless, but I want to use a real example. So they sell their product at retail for $8 and per unit, they factored in a labor cost of, I think it was like 65 cents or something like that. Right. So like five cents for, you know, five minutes per unit, something like that. When you do the math, what they're saying is that I think it broke down to like an 8% labor cost. No business operates with an 8% labor cost. So it's like they're doing the work and they're doing the work that they think they're supposed to be doing, Mm -hmm. but they're not looking at the numbers, as I say, holistically, because when you do, you can identify 8% labor costs. That seems unrealistic. And clearly in that labor cost, I'm not factoring in paying myself. I'm not factoring in any other team members that are going to be you know, on the floor or in the kitchen or, you know, et cetera. So you're sort of setting yourself up for a price change down the road at some point. Mm -hmm. (laughs) So, (laughs) so, I mean, again, it, like, it doesn't have to be complicated, but it's just sort of looking at things in a, in a realistic and more holistic view, as opposed to a vacuum. And, you know, I'm so glad that you brought up labor because it's been on sort of my mind lately. It's like, be more realistic about it. If you think, you know, an industry average is between 30 and 35%, especially for a good food business, factor that labor cost percentage into the cost of your product, not this like really sort of dialed in, you know, dollars and cents. 
Yeah. I always think the, the labor seems challenging too. Cause it's like, okay, well, so it, it takes 65 cents to make this jar of product, but like, what if it's bubbling away on the stove and you're over there, like, you know, working on your brand strategy, like while it's <laughs> cooking, <laughs> like, how do you factor that in? I don't know. It seems so complicated it. to me. Um, and, and so I, who's not dual tasking. Right. Exactly. Like we're all and, multitasking. And- Flip side of that, what I also like to talk about is, you know, when you hand off that responsibility to a team member, you know, they, or, or multiple team members, their job is not to walk into the kitchen and everything's going to be magically where it's supposed to be (laughs) and, and cooking, you know, start to finish. There is setup, there is cleanup, there's potential team management, right? If you've Mm. got a couple different projects going on, you've got literally someone typically washing the dishes, right? Like, and, and people say, oh, I factored that in, you know, the setup and the teardown into that time. But I think a big takeaway, the, at least the first one for the finance piece is your labor costs will always be more expensive than that dollar and cents that you like calculate it to in that, in that early part. So really think about it on the, on the bigger picture level of probably closer to 30% um, as a, as a starting point until you get into operation and you can see what it, what it truly is. I think that's a safer place to start when you're pricing. That said, I think that full financial modeling is, is really the ultimate way to go. Yeah. I feel like the, in, I feel like the successful brands that I see have, I mean, this is why we're talking about it today, but have done the brand strategy, the financial modeling and the, the sales strategy and really understand that these are three pieces that, that work so well together and are so important for, for figuring out, you know, what your brand is going to be all about. What are your values? Like, how are you pricing your products? Is your consumer willing to pay that price? And do you have the right retail outlets to connect your brand with that consumer at that price point? Right. And I think try to do it linear, linearly, is that a word? Um, And (laughs) and they think, okay, what comes first? And we even had that conversation, right? (laughs) for today's podcast. And it's like, well, typically the product comes first and simultaneously you need to be thinking about your brand strategy and who are the competitors for your product. And you need to be thinking about your cost and you need to be thinking about where does my consumer shop? And, and so, you know, it's, it really is the three pillars. They're like, they're important all together at the same time. Sarah, I'm glad you brought up pricing before too, because, you know, we've talked in the past about, um, you know, when it's okay and when it's not okay to use industry norms when Mm -hmm. you're talking finances. And then also the idea of pricing that, you know, just looking at what's on the shelf is not necessarily a good indicator because um, you don't know if those other brands are profitable or not. So I wanted to bring this up now because I think we've got three good you know, minds here in terms of these three different pillars to just touch on that a little bit where, um, you know, you've got to be realistic about what the market can bear and what a buyer will say, you know, are you crazy and what your finances can support. But I, you know, I just want to throw that out there because I think it's a really interesting, interesting topic. Yeah. I think I, I totally agree with you, Katie. And I, I, I'm going to push back and say that there's there's always a most expensive product yeah. in a category, right? So like, I don't want to say why not, why not you? Like, why isn't it you, right? Like someone has to be the most expensive. That's just like the, the nature of the game. And I, I think it, it goes back to building a brand that resonates with the audience that's willing to pay that price, right? Exactly. You can't have, you can't be that premium, most expensive brand without, you know, building that value and proving why basically either to the buyer or the end consumer. Totally. I think about it with, with sales strategy too, right? If you are that premium, beautiful, you know, chocolate bar company and you are selling your bars for, let's just say um, $12.99, which would be like high end you're probably not going to have success in the convenience channel where you are trying to sell into 7-Elevens, right? Because that consumer is walking into 7-Eleven and they're looking for a Ritter Sport 
on their way, like on their ro- on their road trip, right? Like they're not they're not uh, consuming in the same way as someone who would be walking into William Sonoma and looking for a beautiful chocolate for a gift. Yeah, and this is literally the a, like one point of many, but it's but it's a really big point on the you know on the map of building a successful food business is that where all three of these pillars come together because to, you know, from my perspective, right, we're going to do the work of determining how much do you need to charge, right? right? Based on the ingredients, based on the packaging that you have determined is, is right for your brand, right. And right for your consumer, how much do you actually need to charge and then do the homework of, okay, well, where do I sit? on the shelf price wise mm-hmm. compared to my competition am i speaking to my consumers in a way that they're going to understand and believe in the value and the price right that that i'm doing and then and and at that price point and for this consumer who am i selling to right in terms yeah. of the wholesale businesses so it's such mm-hmm. a perfect example of how three how each of the three pillars comes together and informs one another I love totally. Oh, I'm like, I just want everyone to work with all three of us. And so they're like, <laughs> check, 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 like successful brand. <laughs> it's, it it, in my master class, I talk about at the end, I give a little bit of tough love. I'm not, yeah. I usually reserve my tough love for one on one patients, but at the end, it's like, you know, I want you to do this work now, not after you yeah. sort out your market, yes. after you sort out who your, your, you know, clients are, not after you've, you know, whatever, done the other work, right? Like do it in the beginning because yeah. it's going to save you time and it's going to save you money and it's going to save you potential, you know, heartache. Um, which yeah. Is, yeah. You know, I mean, on a prevent for business owners. I'll tell you, I see, I see this on retail ready calls every single month. I was going to say with people crying, but it's not that extreme, but it's, but it's people saying, you know, I built my product regionally. I've, you know, um, I've really had like a grasp on my region here. It's time to expand nationally. Like I've got this three-year vision. I'm going to be in whole foods across the nation. And yet you know, of course, UNFI wants me to do quarterly promotions. Whole Foods wants me to do promotions. You know, I'm not, you know, beating down Whole Foods, but you know, any, any chain, right. They want me to do promotions. They want me to pay into their like literally like printed catalog that they send out, which is ridiculous and expensive. Uh, My distributor wants me to do free fills and introductory offers. And those, those brands just don't have the margin to do that because they haven't figured out, figured it out from the beginning. Right. So I think that's where like the, the dreaded price increase comes in because they're like, Oh shoot, now it's time to go national. And I don't, I don't have any padding. Yeah. Or, or worse, they agree to work with the distributor. They're locked in and then they make the discovery. We're going to make a dollar a unit on this or less right <laughs> yeah. well can we go back and change so then they come to you Allie right they make that discovery with me yep. come back to you and they say okay well how do I roll out a price change with a distributor and wholesale yep. that I like just started working with yeah that's panic yeah time. yeah it is pan. <laughs> I, you know, I'll say it is panic time from the producer perspective. And wow. one of the things that I that I do like to remind my students of is that this is business, right? And while a price change, or I'll even bring this to you too, Katie, like while a packaging change, either like a size or color or you know even a, a brand name, while those changes feel like enormous things to the founder. As, as a wholesale buyer, as a grocery buyer, I would see those changes every day. I would literally get like a price change in my inbox every day <laughs> or a case pack change in my inbox or a um, literally like names, names of product changing or discontinued SKUs or like all of these things. And so I think it is really important to realize that at the end of the day, it's business and as a founder, you have to make the decisions that will keep your business healthy. And then how you communicate that to your partners all along the supply chain are important, but it's not, um, it's not as dramatic 
as it, as, as we think it is, as we might think it is, if that makes sense. Yeah. Well, Allie, are there situations though that are dramatic? Like I know when there's a UPC change, so it changes mm. in the system. Maybe you just want to touch on some of those that are a big deal. Yeah. A UPC change is, is a bigger one because it affects the product at the point of sale. Like you mm-hmm. said, Katie. So if, if you change your UPC, you know, the barcode that is on your product without telling the retailer, and this happens a lot, it means that that product gets put on the shelf and it gets, you know, stocked. It gets in shoppers baskets, they get to the cash register and it literally will not scan at the register. And I got to tell you, like, again, seems like a little, like no big deal, but for that cashier, who has like the growing line behind them and you know, they've got products that aren't scanning. It's a really big deal, you know, and for that frustrated shopper, who's maybe like juggling a couple kids and like trying to get out of there. Like that is a really big deal when the products don't scan. So I think things like that, Katie, that's a great question. Um, UPC changes are really important. I think price changing price changes are important. Um, you know, case count, Changes mm-hmm. are important, but we can navigate that. I say we like on the store level, we can navigate that with clear communication. So say Good. you're going to change your UPC or you're going to do a price increase. I recommend that you give your retail partners as much advance notice as possible. And so you say something like, as of January 1st, we will be increasing our prices by $1 per unit. You know, the, officially, there mm-hmm. you go. And then two weeks later, you say, here's your second reminder that we are increasing our prices as of January 1st. Yeah. And then when they order on December 28th, you write back to them and you say, you will notice on your next order, your next delivery, you will see new pricing mm-hmm. um, on the invoice. Yeah. And so I'm just a fan of clear communication with your partners. Um, and, and, you know, we can navigate any sort of, any sort of change that needs to be made in the business, as long as, uh, there's transparency there. I typically will recommend to my clients that if we're doing a price review, a cost profit price, you know, the whole deal that if they're going to make a price change, you do it all at once. Like don't drip out Mm. a series of product changes because what happens sometimes is sort of the panic that I was referring to a couple minutes ago. It's like, oh gosh, we're losing money or what right. So there's that level of panic and you think I must act immediately. But if you if you act every time you learn something about your business, right, you're gonna be in fight or flight for the (laughs) forever. (laughs) Um so do you agree sort of get control of the whole product yeah. Life and, and yeah, absolutely. And, you know, I think about it from the buyer perspective too. Like I, I can handle a price increase once a year or a price increase eh, maybe once every eight months. But like, if you are coming back to me every <laughs> three months with a price increase on a different skew, like it's a, that would be a red flag to me that you don't have a hold of what's going on in your business, yeah. right? It's a pain in the butt. Uh, we also think about line pricing across the board in, in product sets where if let's say you sell three SKUs of something, Katie, um, excuse me, Sarah, like you might think about this from a financial perspective, if you're going to figure out your, your cost and like standardize it for all three. Right. Mm -hmm. Or if you were going to charge the retailer three different prices, but as the retailer, like, even if you are charging me three different prices, I still might line price them so that the consumer isn't making a decision based off price and rather they're making a decision based off, you know, flavor. Um, so easier it's, for promos too. Oh, it's sorry. so much easier for promos. You're right, Katie. Um, so really thinking about, you know, if you are going to update pricing, like I want it all at once. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And then of course, I mean, gosh, I just, I just keep coming back to this idea that it's all connected, right? Like if you're going to do a price increase, you've got to have that branding, that brand strategy that matches your, you know, higher price that you're asking on the shelf. And it's just, it's just so connected. And I, I feel like it's, it's so easy to work on one thing in your business and forget about the other thing. And like, you know, it's, it's so easy just to keep it all separated and not, not really realize how much they're all connected. 
Yeah. I think if people, you know, leave this conversation and they approach their business thinking, okay, I'm, I've learned something new or I'm focusing on an area, right? And then you say, okay, this is dealing specifically in finance. How will this affect my brand strategy and my sales strategy? Or, or how does it influence it and vice versa? And I do that in my business too. And I'm sure both of you do as well. You, you, we're, we try to learn to think from that CEO level, right? Mm-hmm. Like nothing happens in a vacuum. So if you really pull back for a second, really think about everything together, it'll start to become second nature where yeah. you're, you know, thinking everything through in one, in one shot rather than sort of hopping from, from one to the next. And I feel like it's, it, it, it's more work for the business owner in the long run when you do yeah. it that way. I'll, I'll separate it out. Yeah. I, I will say I am an advocate of focusing because I know personally, you know, if I listen to 20 podcasts across all the different areas that interest me in my business, I get overwhelmed and I just start to feel stuck. And I know that I've heard clients say the same thing. And so I always do like to say, you know, what's, what's the next thing that you need to work on? Is it that your financials are way out of whack and that you can't scale and that you shouldn't be thinking about the retailers next because you haven't figured out that financial foundation that will make it, um, you know, scalable. But I really like what you're saying, Sarah, that yes, you need to focus on what is important next, but also wearing that general manager hat or the brand manager hat, if you don't have someone else doing that to, um, to make sure that you're still taking everything into account, because it really is so aligned that if you do something, you know, you change your ingredients, for example, to reduce your product costs, and then it takes, it's contradictory to what your messaging has been in the market and why people love you, or it changed the taste or it changed the performance obviously that's an issue. So I think you're right. We've got to all learn to really think holistically and prioritize at the same time. Yeah. I think it can be challenging for a founder to do that though, it right? Is. When they're like, I'm so busy. I don't have time for this. Right. I it mean- is. It is. And one thing I'll add is that um, in a podcast episode that I recently did, I talked about if you need to be the, it's either do build or buy. So you Mm. can either do it yourself. You can build the capabilities either through courses like ours or um, programs or hiring coaches, or you can buy it and have a consultant or, you know, a team member externally come in and train you how to do it so that they do it in the near term. And maybe you do it long-term, but there's that do build or buy perspective can help people figure out, okay, in the near term and the long term, how can I get help? Now, not everyone is in a position that they can even afford to get additional help, um, I think you're right though. It, it's hard as all of us are entrepreneurs yeah. too. And we are juggling a lot of things, no matter the size of our team. Do build or buy. I like that. I, the way I had, had thought about it was like, you either pay with your time or you pay with your money, oh, but same, so yeah. I, I like the, I like your phrase, do build or buy. I'm going to have to go and listen to that episode, Katie. I think that that would be right up my alley. Yeah. I think you're right. You'll love it. Allie, can I back up a second and talk a little bit? Cause we heard about the, the brand strategy pillar. And then I sort of shared a little bit about, you know, what, where the pillar of, of, for the finance, like where that begins, can you describe sort of the brand, the, sorry, the sales strategy pillar, or at least yeah. like where, where to begin? Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I'm happy to talk about that. So when I think about the sales strategy pillar, I, I, I think about it as being really straightforward. It's as straightforward as as figuring out where we are going to sell our products that align us with our brand and our financials, right? I'm just going to keep coming back to this theme. So typically it would be deciding between direct to consumer, e-commerce, retail accounts, or food service. Those are like the four big ones that we think about. And then, then once we decide on that, it becomes a little bit more layered, right? Like if I'm going to do retail accounts, am I going to pursue independent specialty stores or am I going to go big box and do the chains? Or am I going to try to get into club stores like Sam's and Costco and things like that? Or I'm going to try to sell into Trader Joe's, right? So when we think about sales strategy, it's really thinking about who, again, who are my consumers? What is my price point? And where, where are these people shopping so that I can put my product in front of my fans, right? So I think I, I, I think about the most successful food businesses as being the ones who have an omni-channel strategy, right? This was a really big thing that came up in 2020 that 
that those brands who, I mean, I saw it with retail ready students too, but like those brands who primarily focused on food service. So that's either, you know, selling direct to restaurants, selling to corporate cafeterias, selling to, you know, golf courses and hotels and things like that. Those are the ones who really had to pick up the pieces in 2020 and reconfigure their businesses. And the brands who had this multi-pronged approach, this omni-channel strategy, were the ones who navigated 2020 a little bit more gracefully. So it does go back to this idea of like not putting all of your eggs in one basket and making sure that you are diversifying your sales channels so that you're not in in a pickle when something unexpected comes up like like it did last year. Um, but Sarah, does that make sense? Like from, from a high level, it really is figuring out where are you going to sell your product that puts it in front of consumers? Um, once we decide on that, you know, there, there are lots of other decisions that go into play. Right. And that's, that's where brand strategy comes in. Right. Am I a high end brand? What is my pack size? Am I doing single serves or am I doing, you know, multi-packs? Am I going like Costco size on these things? You know, what is my pricing? Am I, am I the Seven Eleven price or am I the, like I said, the, the William Sonoma price, the food 52 price. It really goes back into figuring out, um, what you want to be as a brand and, and where your consumers are. There's no wrong answers. It's, you know, it's just, it's just figuring out the, the map of where you want to go. I love that. Something I wrote down um, early on is, you know, to be successful in anything, right? You first have to know where you are and where you want to be. Yeah. And going back to the three pillars, right? It's like, I want to be, because people will come to me and say, I want to be a million dollar business. Yep. Well, how, how are you going to do that? Right. And, and also, by the way, do you want to be a million dollar revenue business or do you want to be a million dollar profit business? Right. That'd be nice. <laughs> no, but it's like, okay, if you want to be a million dollar, let's say top line business, how much are you making now? Where are you selling now? What, you know, what is your brand strategy yeah. and what has to change? What do you need to implement? How do you need to grow in order to, to get there? And you have to pay attention to all three pillars and consider them in order to sort that out. Totally. So can I go ahead and use a a client example that we've all shared? Yeah. Okay. So I think about like Kristen from Blue Bus um, and she makes cultured products. She does, you know, like sauerkraut and kombucha and things like that. And, you know, I, I think we can use her as a really good example because One, she's a smart woman who has invested in each of these pillars of her business. But, you know, say Kristen decided that she wanted to start selling her sauerkraut, her refrigerated sauerkraut nationally in Target's right? She would need to be prepared to work with a distributor who can handle refrigerated products. She would need to be aware of the financial implications that come with that, right? The placement deals, the quarterly promotions, like I talked about, the free fills, the slotting fees, (laughs) those printed circulars, like all of those things. She would probably reconsider her case size, knowing that she was going to start doing free fills and placements. Um, She might double check her glass jars actually can ship across country and like are sturdy enough so she doesn't get a bunch of breakage. I mean, it doesn't mean that Kristen (laughs) couldn't have success selling in targets across the country, but it means that we would probably go back and really look at again, like the brand strategy and the financials to make sure that they supported this new national sales strategy of hers. Yeah. Does that make sense? Totally. I'm so glad you brought up Kristen too, because I actually told her we were doing this episode and she was so excited. And she said, I cannot wait to hear this powerhouse of um, ladies come together. So Uh, the thing that she said in her email too, I won't read it exactly. I will forward it to you guys, but um, she just was saying that she felt like we each really understood um, her business and were compassionate mm -hmm. in our approaches, which I think, you know, is something that we do here that we understand that Mm -hmm. people have different goals and that's great. What, you know, we can help you get there and we can be your tutors and we can be your tough coaches. And um, so the thing that really got me though, that she was saying in the email was that 
people don't, you know, similar to what we were saying before, Ali, when you said, you know, but how do people even, you can't do it all. So how do they know where to start? And she was saying the same thing. And so then, you know, she kind of ended the email by saying the mentorship and guidance is so valuable that now she thinks, you know, she's, she's so glad that she found it. And she says, um, I I don't know how we could afford not to do it. So it was just such a, like, oh, it, it made me feel really happy that, um, you know, as we're talking about these three pillars that she's one of the people that comes to mind that, you know, like you said, really gets it. And I'm so glad that she values, um, and recognizes the value of, of focusing on all three. Oh, Katie, thanks for sharing that. And yeah. Kristen, thanks for saying that about us. I, I want to compliment Kristen. I was thinking about this today and, and just how proud I am of her for asking difficult questions Mm. about her business. And, you know, when we first started working together and it's still only been a few months, she wanted to hit the ground running. It was like, here's all the information that you need to understand my business from a financial perspective. We had a goal, you know, conversation, right? Where are you now? And where do you want to take your business? And we laid it all out on the table. What are all the things you need to consider? She brought all of her questions to the table and was willing to do the work. And and at one point she said herself, God, this is a bit uncomfortable and a little (laughs) scary. And it's like, yes, but when you come out on the other side with Mm. all of the confidence that I'm certain she is going to have in her business, it's all that uncomfortableness is worth it. And, and, you know, when you get uncomfortable, that's how, you know, big stuff is happening in your business. So I'm just really proud of her. And, and yeah, that was the really sweet message that she sent. That's grateful for that. Yeah. I think it's, it's so, it's, it's really fantastic when, when people get to that point where they realize how could I, I couldn't afford not to do this work because I think the three of us have probably seen countless examples of people who waste so much money. They waste so much time. They waste so much mental energy going back and redoing the work, um, you know, months, years into their business because they haven't put in the foundations from the beginning. Yeah. Yeah. You know, websites are a good example or packaging redesigns where I've heard some people say, I just need to get through this website redesign and then I'll focus on my brand strategy. <laughs> and I'm <laughs> wrong <laughs> order. I, right. Uh, um, because who are you talking to? What are you saying? What's the next step you want them to take? All of these things that become so much clearer and then integrating with all of your other um, marketing tools like social media and, you know, again, the packaging and they all need to work together. So yeah, it is, it is true. It's not always easy to figure out what to do first, but I think that's why we each have a tool, you know, to put a little shameless plug in here. I think we each have a tool. That's a really good place to um, know where to start. And even if you think that you're a little bit beyond that, there's no harm in going back to the basics and just, you know, let's just check the box, say, okay, I do have it all. Um, But for people who don't, you know, who know that they've got room to improve, I think all of our um, our materials that we can share are a really good place to start. Yeah, Yeah, absolutely. And speaking of working together, can I, can I say that we're going to do a giveaway here on, on this podcast episode? Let's share. Okay. So details will be in the show notes, but what we're going to do is give away an hour of our time together where one of our listeners can come on. They can join our seat here at the table and talk about the three pillars of your business. I'm, I'm so excited for this. You guys, it's going to be too. good. I, I'm, I cannot wait. Number one, it's going to be the first time we've ever, you know, we, as we said, we, we have clients in common, but we've never all sat down together. And I just think mm-hmm. the impact could be really amazing. And I mean, I'm, I'm already super excited about it. Yeah. Oh, what a great way to kick off 2021. For sure. Okay. Ladies, I think, I think we covered almost all of it. Is there anything left that you really got to say about the three pillars? (laughs) I think we could talk all day. (laughs) Maybe we'll do a part two. Uh, Yes. (laughs) One little note. And, and that's just that you know, wherever you are in the life of your business, it is never too late to take a beat, or as I like to say, slow yeah. down and just really be thoughtful about, you know, where do you want to go? And, or, or even if you aren't really sure where you are at right now, right? Some, some business owners have, have that sort of feeling going on. Um, it's okay. 
it's okay to slow down. It's okay to ask the questions and just kind of like you were saying, Katie, like go back to the beginning and check those boxes before mm -hmm. you decide to move forward. And, you know, as business owners ourselves, I know that we sometimes feel like we got to keep moving forward. We have to keep pushing and keep progressing. And it can, it can make us anxious. At least that's my truth. And so mm -hmm. I always just encourage people to slow down and that it's never too late to, to do the work, even if you kind of get can sort of start from the beginning in a sense um, to make sure you're on the right path. Yeah. Set those foundations. Mm -hmm. Well said. All right, you guys, thank you for saying yes to my, my wacky idea of getting all three of us uh, to do an episode on all three of our podcasts. I'm, I'm so appreciative of you two and the work that you guys do in the industry. Um, this was so much fun for me. Yeah, same. Thank you. I really value that we can work together and work with brands to, um, you know, build them and help them be more sustainable. Yeah, I agree. And thanks for the, the invite. I think this is an awesome idea. And um, I love working with you ladies and calling you colleagues and friends. So happy new year. Great. Happy new year. Bye. Bye. Today's episode is brought to you by the Financial Success Formula, Retail Ready, and Brand Strategy Streamlined, three online programs focused on helping food and beverage founders work through the three pillars of a successful food business. Retail Ready with Ali Ball covers the sales strategy. Brand Strategy Streamlined with Katie ensures you're building a product line that people know, love, and purchase over and over again. And the financial success formula with me will ensure you know your numbers and can achieve financial sustainability and profitability. Find details on each of our programs in today's show notes. If you liked today's conversation, you're going to love our online programs. All right, guys, I hope that you enjoyed the opportunity to hear from Katie and Allie, two women who I admire so much in our industry. I hope you'll join me in the Profitable Food Business community or send me a DM on Instagram to let me know which pillar you are focusing on at this start to 2021. I'd love to connect with you and support you along the way. So before we wrap up, don't forget to take part in our giveaway where you can win an hour of time with Allie. Katie and me. So find this week's podcast post on Instagram. It's going to outline all of the details to enter our giveaway. It's easy and it's a great prize. I'll also link to that post directly in the show notes. Thank you so much for joining us today. I'll talk to you again on Monday when we'll be joined by an industry veteran who's going to help you find the right bookkeeper for your food business and build a successful working relationship with them. I know that's something so many of you are interested in doing. Until then, have a great day.